Chapter 5. Stalinism Revisited, or How Stalin Saved the Humanity of Man. The Stalinist Cultural Counter-Revolution. A consistent conservative case can be made that Far from being the greatest catastrophe that could have befallen Russia, Stalinism effectively saved what we understand as the humanity of man. Crucial here is the great shift of the early and mid-1930s from proletarian egalitarianism to the full assertion of the Russian legacy. In the cultural sphere, figures such as Pushkin and Tchaikovsky were elevated far above modernism. Traditional aesthetic norms of beauty were reasserted. Homosexuality was outlawed sexual promiscuity condemned, and marriage proclaimed the elementary cell of the new society. It was the end of the brief marriage of convenience between Soviet power and the artistic and scientific modernists. In cinema, this passage is clearly discernible in the shift from Eisenstein's silent films with their montage of attractions to his organicist sound films. In music, in the shift from Shostakovich's violent, parodic, provocative music with elements of circus and jazz from the 1920s to his return to more traditional forms in the late 1930s. The standard reading of this shift sees it as the cultural thermidor, the betrayal of the authentic revolution. However, before accepting this judgment at face value, one should take a closer look at the ideological vision which sustained radical egalitarianism. We refer here again to so-called biocosmism. A good example here is the following passage by Trotsky. What is a man? He is by no means a finished or harmonious being. No, he is still a highly awkward creature. Man, as an animal, has not evolved by plan, but spontaneously, and has accumulated many contradictions. The question of how to educate and regulate, of how to improve and complete the physical and spiritual construction of man, is a colossal problem which can only be understood on the basis of socialism. To produce a new, improved version of man, that is the future task of communism. And for that, we have first to find out everything about man, his anatomy, his physiology, and that part of his physiology which is called his psychology. Man must look at himself and see himself as a raw material, or at best, as a semi-manufactured product, and say, at last, my dear Homo sapiens, I will work on you. These were not just idiosyncratic theoretical principles, but expressions of a real mass movement in art, architecture, psychology, pedagogy, and organizational sciences, comprising hundreds of thousands of people. The officially supported cult of Taylorism, whose most radical exponent was Alexei Gastev, a Bolshevik engineer and poet who used the term biomechanics as early as 1922, explored the vision of society in which man and machine would merge. Gastev ran the Institute of Labour, which carried out experiments to train workers to act like machines. He saw the mechanization of man as the next step in evolution, envisaging a utopia where people would be replaced by proletarian units, identified by ciphers such as ABC or 325-0750 and so on. A mechanized collectivism would take the place of the individual personality in the psychology of the proletariat. There would no longer be a need for emotions, and the human soul would no longer be measured by a shout or a smile, but by a pressure gauge or a speedometer. Is not this dream the first radical formulation of what today one usually calls biopolitics? Counterintuitive as this may sound, one can argue that this vision had it really been imposed, would have been much more terrifying than Stalinism actually was. It was against this threat of full-scale modernist mechanization that Stalinist cultural politics reacted. It not only demanded a return to artistic forms that would be attractive to large crowds, but also, although it may appear cynical, the return to elementary traditional forms of morality. In the Stalinist show trials, the victims were held responsible for certain acts, forced to confess. In short, though it may appear a scene, and it was, they were treated as autonomous ethical subjects, not as objects of biopolitics. Against the utopia of mechanized collectivism, high Stalinism of the 1930s stood for the return of ethics at its most violent, as an extreme measure to counteract the threat that traditional moral categories would be rendered meaningless, 
where unacceptable behaviour would not be perceived as involving the subject's guilt, but as a malfunctioning measured by a social pressure gauge or a speedometer. This is also why the imposition of socialist realism was sincerely welcomed by a large majority of people. It signalled that the regime had completely abandoned its commitment to the revolutionary idea of establishing a proletarian or Soviet form of culture that could be distinguished from the culture of the past. Contemporary writers like Akhmatova could not find a publisher, but the complete works of Pushkin and Turgenev, Chekhov and Tolstoy, although not Dostoevsky, were issued in their millions as a new readership was introduced to them. This return to classical culture reached its peak in 1937, the centenary of Pushkin's death, when the whole country was involved in festivities, small provincial theatres put on plays, schools organised special celebrations, young communists went on pilgrimages to places connected with the poet's life, factories organised study groups and clubs of Pushkinists, collective farms held Pushkin carnivals with figures dressed as characters from Pushkin's fairy tales. These facts are worth mentioning because they bring us to another paradox. How the very resistance to Stalinism, marginal and oppressed as it was, followed this cultural trend. That is to say, although hypocritical and censured, this massive reintroduction of the classical Russian cultural heritage was more than just a measure for enlightening the half-illiterate masses. The universe of great classics such as Pushkin and Tolstoy contained an entire vision of culture, with its own ethics of social responsibility, of solidarity with the oppressed against autocratic power. Dissidents in the USSR represented truthfulness, unexpurgated reality and ethical values, as against the fantasy reality of socialist realism and the pervasive falseness of Soviet public discourse, with its concerted negation of traditional morality, an explicitly stated, indeed fundamental, ingredient in the Soviet regime's forwarding of revolutionary development. In this sense, Solzhenitsyn himself is the son of the Stalinist cultural politics of the 1930s. This is also why the private works of Shostakovich, full of melancholy, despair and private anxieties, centred on his string quartets, are no less an organic part of the Stalinist culture than his great public works, centred in his officially celebrated symphonies, 5, 7, and 11. And this brings us to the third paradox. Wilhelm Furtwangler's remarked apropos Stravinsky's Rite of Spring that it shows the limitation of Russian spirituality. It exults in brilliant mechanic rhythmic explosions but it cannot reach the level of organic living unity that characterizes German spirituality. The first irony is that the very same composers to which Furtwängler referred were perceived by the Russian traditionalists as Western modernizers endangering the Russian organic heritage. However, in a way, Furtwängler was right. Many Western travelers to Russia in the 18th and 19th centuries went there in search of an organic society a living social whole, as opposed to Western individualist societies, which were held together by the external pressure of laws. They soon discovered that Russia was actually a vast, chaotic empire, lacking precisely any inner organic form, and therefore ruled by the iron hand of the brutal imperial autocracy. In other words, the notion of old Russia, whose harmonious balance was disturbed by Western modernization, was mythical. Violent modernism, the brutal imposition of a central order onto the chaotic texture of social life, is thus a key component of traditional Russian social identity. Stalin was correct to celebrate Ivan the Terrible as his precursor. Is, then, the conclusion of this that, with regret, one should endorse Stalinism as the defence against a much worse threat? What about applying here to Lacan's motto, le père ou le pire? and take the risk of the choice of the worst? What if the effective result of choosing to pursue to the end the biopolitical dream would have been something unpredictable that would have shaken the very coordinates of this dream? A letter which did not reach its destination, and thereby perhaps saved the world. The Stalinist terror of the 1930s was a humanist terror. Its adherence to a humanist core was not what constrained its horror, it was what sustained it. It was its inherent condition of possibility. What if the legacy of the humanist tradition, resuscitated by high Stalinism, not only created the ideological presuppositions for dissident resistance, but also saved the world in a quite literal way, namely prevented global nuclear catastrophe, 
during the Cuban Missile Crisis. As far as one can reconstruct the events today, two things combined to facilitate the happy outcome. The first was polite tact, the rituals of polite feigned ignorance, if one is to believe recent revelations. Kennedy's stroke of genius, which was crucial for the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis, was to pretend that a key letter had not arrived at its destination, to act as if this letter did not exist, a strategy in which, of course, only worked because the sender, Khrushchev, participated in it. On Friday, October 22, 1962, a letter from Khrushchev to Kennedy confirms the offer previously made through intermediaries. The missiles would be removed if the US issued a pledge not to invade Cuba. On Saturday, October 27, before a US answer, another harsher and more demanding letter from Khrushchev arrived, adding the removal of US missiles from Turkey as a condition and signaling a possible political coup in the Soviet Union. At 8.05 p.m. the same day, Kennedy sent a response to Khrushchev, informing him that he was accepting the proposal of October 26, that is, acting as if the October 27th letter had never existed. On Sunday, October 28th, Kennedy received a letter from Khrushchev in which he agreed to the deal. The lesson of this is that in such moments of crisis where the fate of everything hangs in the balance, saving appearances, politeness, the awareness that one is playing a game matters more than ever. One can also claim that what triggered the crisis was a symmetrical fact, a letter which also did not arrive at its addressee, but this time because it was never sent. Soviet missiles were stationed in Cuba as the result of the secret mutual security pact between Cuba and the USSR. Many observers, most notably Ted Sorensen, suggested that the US reaction would have been much less offensive if the mutual security pact had been made public in advance, as Castro had wanted, incidentally. It was the secrecy on which Soviets had insisted that made the US believe that the missile emplacement could have no purpose other than to launch an attack upon the US. If the entire process of signing the pact and installing the missiles had been in the open and transparent, it would have been perceived as something much less threatening, not as the preparation of a real attack, but simply as demonstrated posturing, which posed no real military threat. This lesson was not learned by the US military establishment which interpreted the peaceful resolution of the crisis in quite a different way. Its opinion is best rendered by Raymond Gartoff, at the time an intelligence analyst in the State Department. If we have learned anything from this experience, it is that weakness, even only apparent weakness, invites Soviet transgression. At the same time, firmness in the last analysis will force the Soviets to back away from rash initiatives. The crisis is thus perceived as the eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation of two players, a macho game of chicken, where the one with greater toughness, inflexibility, and resolve wins. This view, of course, does not fit reality. A whole series of details demonstrate Kennedy's flexibility and his concessions to the Soviet need to save face by way of salvaging something positive from the crisis. In order to buy some time and avoid a direct confrontation, he permitted on October 25th a Soviet tanker to proceed through the quarantine. On October 28th, he ordered that no interview should be given and no statement made which would claim any kind of victory. Furthermore, he made an offer of removing US missiles from Turkey as well as a guarantee that the US would not invade Cuba, in exchange for which the Soviets would withdraw their missiles from Cuba. The Soviet perception of the crisis was different. For them, it was not the threat of force that ended the crisis. The Soviet leadership believed the crisis had ended because both Soviet and US officials had realized they were at the brink and that the crisis was threatening to destroy humankind. They did not fear only for their immediate safety and were not worried merely about losing a battle in Cuba. Their fear was the fear of deciding the fate of millions of others, even of civilization itself. It was this fear, experienced by both sides at the peak of the crisis, which enabled them to reach a peaceful solution. And it was this fear which was at the very core of the famous exchange of letters between Khrushchev and Fidel Castro at the climax of the crisis. In a letter to Khrushchev on October 26, Castro wrote that if the imperialists invade Cuba with the goal of occupying it, the danger that that aggressive policy poses for humanity is so great that following that event the Soviet Union must never allow the circumstances in which the imperialists could launch the first nuclear strike against it. 
I tell you this because I believe that the imperialists' aggressiveness is extremely dangerous, and if they actually carry out the brutal act of invading Cuba in violation of international law and morality, that would be the moment to eliminate such danger forever through an act of clear legitimate defense, however harsh and terrible the solution would be, for there is no other. Khrushchev answered Castro on October 30th. In your cable of October 27th, you propose that we be the first to launch a nuclear strike against the territory of the enemy. You, of course, realize where that would have led. Rather than a simple strike, it would have been the start of a thermonuclear world war. Dear Comrade Fidel Castro, I consider this proposal of yours incorrect, although I understand your motivation. We have lived through the most serious moment when a nuclear world war could have broken out. Obviously, in that case, the United States would have sustained huge losses, but the Soviet Union and the whole socialist camp would have also suffered greatly. As far as Cuba is concerned, it would be difficult to say, even in general terms, what this would have meant for them. In the first place, Cuba would have been burned in the fire of war. There's no doubt that the Cuban people would have fought courageously or that they would have died heroically. But we are not struggling against imperialism in order to die but to take advantage of all our possibilities, to lose less in the struggle and win more to overcome and achieve the victory of communism. The essence of Khrushchev's argument can be best summed up by Neil Kinnock's argument for unilateral disarmament when he was the Labour leader. I am ready to die for my country, but I am not ready to let my country die for me. It is significant to note that, in spite of the totalitarian character of the Soviet regime, this fear was far more predominant in the Soviet leadership than in that of the US. So perhaps the time has come to rehabilitate Khrushchev, not Kennedy, as the real hero of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Castro answered Khrushchev on October 31st. I realized when I wrote them that the words contained in my letter could be misinterpreted by you, and that was what happened perhaps because you didn't read them carefully, perhaps because of the translation, perhaps because I meant to say so much in too few lines. However, I didn't hesitate to do it. Do you believe, Comrade Khrushchev, that we were selfishly thinking of ourselves, of our generous people willing to sacrifice themselves, and not at all in an unconscious manner, but fully assured of the risk they ran? No, Comrade Khrushchev. Few times in history, and it could even be said that never before, because no people had ever faced such a tremendous danger, was a people so willing to fight and die with such a universal sense of duty. We knew, and do not presume that we ignored it, that we would have been annihilated, as you insinuate in your letter, in the event of nuclear war. However, that didn't prompt us to ask you to withdraw the missiles. That didn't prompt us to ask you to yield. Do you believe that we wanted that war? But how could we prevent it if the invasion finally took place? And if war had broken out, what could we do with the insane people who unleashed the war? You yourself have said that under current conditions, such a war would inevitably have escalated quickly into a nuclear war. I understand that once aggression is unleashed, one shouldn't concede to the aggressor the privilege of deciding, moreover, when to use nuclear weapons. The destructive power of this weaponry is so great, and the speed of its delivery so great, that the aggressor would have a considerable initial advantage. And I did not suggest to you, Comrade Khrushchev, that the USSR should be the aggressor, because that would be more than incorrect. It would be immoral and contemptible on my part. But from the instant the imperialists attack Cuba, and while there are Soviet armed forces stationed in Cuba to help in our defense in case of an attack from abroad, the imperialists would, by this act, become aggressors against Cuba and against the USSR, and we would respond with a strike that would annihilate them. I did not suggest, Comrade Khrushchev, that in the midst of this crisis the Soviet Union should attack, which is what your letter seems to say. Rather, that following an imperialist attack, the USSR should attack without vacillation and should never make the mistake of allowing circumstances to develop in which the enemy makes the first nuclear strike against the USSR. And in this sense, Comrade Khrushchev, I maintain my point of view because I understand it to be a true and just evaluation of a specific situation. You may be able to convince me that I am wrong, but you can't tell me that I am wrong without convincing me. It is clear that it was Castro himself who purposefully misread Khrushchev here. Khrushchev understood very well what Castro wanted the USSR to do. 
not to attack the U.S. out of nowhere, but in the case of the U.S. invasion of Cuba, still an act of conventional war, and a limited one at that, attacking a recent ally of the USSR, not the USSR itself, to retaliate with total nuclear counterattack. This is what the warning that the USSR should never make the mistake of allowing circumstances to develop in which the enemy makes the first nuclear strike against the USSR can only mean that the USSR should be the first to deal a decisive nuclear strike. Once aggression is unleashed, one shouldn't concede to the aggressor the privilege of deciding, moreover, when to use nuclear weapons. To put it bluntly, Castro was demanding that Khrushchev choose the end of civilized life on Earth over the loss of Cuba. So, again, what we witness here is a confrontation between Khrushchev's humanist considerations, ultimately the legacy of traditional culture resuscitated by high Stalinism, and Castro's ruthless total wager, which echoes Mao Zedong's reflection on the possible annihilation of the human race. As we have noted earlier, Che Guevara approached the same line of thought when he praised the heroic readiness of the Cuban people to risk its own effacement. Kremlinology Stalinism's role in saving the humanity of man is discernible at the most elementary level of language. If the language of the new post-human being was to have been a language of signals, no longer properly representing the subject, no wonder that Stalinist language is the most violent imaginable opposite. What characterizes human language, in contrast to the most complex signals of bees, is what Lacan called empty speech, speech whose denotative value, explicit content, is suspended on behalf of its function as an index of intersubjective relations between speaker and hearer. And this suspension is a key feature of Stalinist jargon, the object of the science of Kremlinology. Before the Soviet-era archives opened wide, foreign scholars trying to make out what had happened and what might come to pass, took abuse for relying upon hearsay. So-and-so had heard from so-and-so, who in turn had heard from someone in the camps, who was sure that, insert fantastic particulars here, critics of such hearsay scholarship had a point. But what few people seem to realise, even now, is that the salient issue might not be the reliability in Stalin's Soviet Union of word of mouth and political divination, but its pervasiveness. Kremlinology arose not at Harvard, but in and around the Kremlin. This was how the entire regime operated, and it was what everyone in the Soviet Union did to a degree, the more so the higher up. Amid the inter-ministerial warfare and Mobius strip intrigues, Stalinist life and death remained opaque, no matter where you stood or whom you knew. It was at the same time formulaic and indeterminate. In April 1939, the nominal head of Comintern, Georgi Dimitrov, frets over his sudden omission in Pravda's coverage of one honor presidium and in Izvestia's of another. His agitation eases when he learns that his portraits were borne aloft at the May Day Parade, which quieted the ominous chit-chat about him. But then it happened again. For the first time on International Women's Day, I was not elected to the Honor Presidium, he records on March 8, 1941. That, of course, is no accident. Ah, but what did it mean? Dimitrov, who could scarcely have been closer to the Kremlin, was an inveterate criminologist, studying mausoleum choreography, divining omens, drowning in rumours. Another comical detail along these lines, the public prosecutor in the show trial against the United Trotskyite Zinovievite Centre published a list of those that this centre was planning to assassinate, Stalin, Kirov, Zdanov. This list became a bizarre honour, since the inclusion signified proximity to Stalin. Although Molotov was on good personal terms with Stalin, he was shocked to discover that he was not on the list. What could this sign mean? Just a warning from Stalin, or an indication that soon it would be his turn to be arrested? 
Here, indeed, the secrets of the Egyptians were secrets also for the Egyptians themselves. It was the Stalinist Soviet Union which was the true empire of signs. A story told by Soviet linguist Eric Han Pira provides a perfect example of the total semantic saturation of this empire of signs, a saturation which, precisely, relied on the emptying of direct denotative meaning. For many years, when the Soviet media announced the funeral ceremonies of a number of senior nomenclatura, it used a cliché formulation. Buried on Red Square by the Kremlin Wall. In the 1960s, however, because of the lack of space, most of the newly deceased dignitaries were cremated and urns with their ashes were placed in niches inside the wall itself. Yet the same old formula was used in press statements. This incongruity compelled 50 members of the Russian Language Institute of the Soviet Academy of Sciences to write a letter to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, suggesting that the phrase be modified to fit the current reality. The urn with ashes was placed in the Kremlin wall. Several weeks later, a representative of the Central Committee phoned the Institute, informing them that the Central Committee had discussed their suggestion and decided to keep the old formulation. He gave no reasons for this decision. According to the rules that regulate the Soviet Empire of Signs, the CC was right. The change would not have been perceived as simply registering the fact that dignitaries were now cremated and their ashes placed in the wall itself. Any deviation from the standard formula would have been interpreted as a sign, triggering frenzied interpretive activity. So, since there was no message to be delivered, why change things? One may oppose to this conclusion the possibility of a simple, rational solution. Why not change the formulation and add an explanation that it meant nothing, that it simply registered a new reality? Such a rational approach totally misses the logic of the Soviet empire of signs, since in it everything has some meaning, even, and especially, a denial of meaning. Such a denial would trigger an even more frantic interpretive activity. It would have been read not only as a meaningful sign within a given, well-established semiotic space, but as a much stronger metasemantic indication that the very basic rules of the semiotic space were changing, thus causing total perplexity, panic even. Some Soviet leaders retained a sense of irony and displayed a dark sense of humour with regard to this total plasticity of facts. When, in early 1956, Anastas Mikoyan flew to Budapest to inform the Hungarian ultra-Stalinist leader Matthias Rakosi of Moscow's decision to depose him, he told Rakosi, The Soviet leadership has decided you are ill. You will need treatment in Moscow. It would be interesting to reread, from this perspective, the model post-World War II Soviet textbook on dialectical materialism. Mark Rosenthal's The Marxist Dialectical Method, whose first edition appeared in Moscow in 1951. In later reprints, long passages were omitted or rewritten. However, these changes had nothing whatsoever to do with the author's further reflections on imminent philosophical problems. They are all to be read strictly in Kremlinological terms, as signals of the shifts in the ideologico-political line. The book, of course, relies on Stalin's systemization of the four main features of dialectical method, the unity of all phenomena, the dynamic nature of reality, the permanent development of reality, the revolutionary nature of this development, which proceeds through sudden jumps, not only through continuous gradual change, from which, significantly, the law of the negation of the negation is absent. See Stalin's On Dialectical and Historical Materialism. In the subsequent editions of Rosenthal's book, the description of these four main features subtly changes. At some point, the negation of the negation is silently readmitted, and so on and so forth. These changes are Kremlinological signals of the shifts in the ideologico-political constellation, the shifts of de-Stalinization which, paradoxically, began under Stalin himself at his instigation. See his two late essays on linguistics and the economy, which paved the way for recognising the relative autonomy and independence 
from class struggle of some sciences. The fact that the negation of the negation is posited as a fundamental ontological feature of reality has thus nothing to do with the cognition of the world and everything to do with the shifts in the ideological political constellation. Is then criminology not a kind of obscene double of Sovietology? The latter studying the Soviet regime objectively through sociological data, statistics, power shifts, and so forth. The former as an obscure semiotic system. From objective to subjective guilt. What kind of subjective position does such a universe imply? Let us take as our starting point Brecht's learning play, Dai Masnama, The Measures Taken, in which a young revolutionary, part of a group of communist agitators sent to China to stimulate revolutionary activity, is killed by fellow communists because they consider him a security risk, and he dutifully assents to his execution. Although this play is often presented as a justification of the Stalinist show trials, there is a crucial distinction between the two. What separated Brecht's fictional agitators from Stalin's very real prosecutors like Vyshinsky and policemen like Beria was the latter's banal insistence that the defendants had really done this or that wicked, blood-soaked, conspiratorial deed, rather than pursuing the idea of a paradoxical objective guilt transcending the actual facts. Brecht stacks the cards in such a way that we, the audience, are bound to embrace the executed hero. Brecht's critical interpreter Herbert Luthi admitted that no communist country or organization has ever staged the play. The party itself does not like so much candor, but failed to notice that Brecht's candor in exposing the ruthlessness of the party line is incompatible with subscribing to it. The true believers invariably kept their knowledge to themselves. The problem with this reading is that it falsifies Brecht's position in two key ways. One, Brecht does not justify the killing of the young comrade in terms of objective guilt, but in terms of pragmatic expediency. The young comrade had removed his mask and revealed his face, thus compromising them all. His killing was not a punishment. Two, for Brecht, the open exposition of the mechanism is not incompatible with subscribing to it. The great dramatic tension of the piece is that, while fully displaying the harshness of the measure taken, the way the unfortunate young comrade's life is ruthlessly sacrificed, he still condones it. The true question is, why can the logic of objective guilt not be explicitly asserted? Why does it have to remain a kind of obscene secret, admitted only in a semi-private place? Why would its full public assertion be self-destructive? We encounter here the mystery of appearance at its purest, objective guilt, the fact that the more you are subjectively innocent with regard to factual accusations, the more you are objectively guilty, must not appear as such. The question is thus, what kind of ethics enables us to talk about objective guilt? Obviously, an immoral ethics. The philosopher of immoral ethics was Friedrich Nietzsche, and we should remember that the title of his masterpiece is The Genealogy of Morals. Morals, not ethics. The two are not the same. Morality is concerned with the symmetry of my relations with other human beings. Its zero-level rule is, do not do to me what you do not want me to do to you. Ethics, on the contrary, deals with my consistency with myself, my fidelity to my own desires. On the back flyleaf of a 1939 edition of Lenin's Materialism and Imperio Criticism, Stalin made the following note in red pencil. 1. Weakness. 2. Idleness. 3. Stupidity. These are the only things that can be called vices. Everything else, in the absence of the aforementioned, is undoubtedly virtue. NB. If a man is 1. strong, spiritually, 2. active, 3. clever, or capable, then he is good, regardless of any other vices. 1 plus 3 
make two. This is as concise as ever a formulation of immoral ethics. In contrast to it, a weakling who obeys moral rules and worries about his guilt stands for unethical morality, the target of Nietzsche's critique of ressentiment. There is, however, a limit to Stalinism, not that it is too immoral, but that it is secretly too moral, still relying on a figure of the big other. As we have seen in what is arguably the most intelligent legitimization of Stalinist terror, Merleau-Ponty's Humanism and Terror from 1946, the terror is justified as a kind of wager on the future, almost in the mode of the theology of Pascal, who enjoins us to make a bet on God. If the final result of today's horror will be the bright communist future, then this outcome will retroactively redeem the terrible things a revolutionary has to do today. Along similar lines, even some Stalinists themselves, when half privately usually, they were forced to admit that many of the victims of the purges were innocent, accused and killed because the party needed their blood to fortify its unity would look to the future moment of final victory in which all the necessary victims would at last be given their due and their innocence and highest sacrifice for the cause would be recognised. This is what Lacan, in his ethics seminar, refers to as the perspective of the last judgment, a perspective even more clearly discernible in one of the key terms of the Stalinist discourse, that of the objective guilt and objective meaning of your acts. While you can be an honest individual who acted with the most sincere intentions, you are nonetheless objectively guilty, if your acts serve reactionary forces. And it is, of course, the party which has the direct access to what your acts objectively mean. Here again, we do not only have the perspective of the last judgment, which formulates the objective meaning of your acts, but also the present agent who already has the unique ability to judge today's events and act from this perspective. We can see now why Lacan's motto, Il n'y a pas de grand autre, there is no big other, brings us to the very core of the ethical problematic. What it excludes is precisely this perspective of the last judgment, the idea that somewhere, even if only as a thoroughly virtual point of reference, even if we concede that we cannot ever occupy its place and pass the actual judgment. There must be a standard which allows us to take a measure of our acts and pronounce their true meaning, their true ethical status. Even Jack Derrida's notion of deconstruction as justice seems to rely on a utopian hope which sustains the spectre of infinite justice, forever postponed, always to come, but nonetheless here as the ultimate horizon of our activity. The harshness of Lacanian ethics is that it demands that we thoroughly relinquish this reference, and its further wager is that not only does this abdication not leave us in the grip of an ethical insecurity or relativism, or even undermine the very foundations of ethical activity, but that renouncing the guarantee of some big other is the very condition of a truly autonomous ethics. Recall that the dream about Irma's injection that Freud used as an exemplary case to illustrate his procedure of analysing dreams is a dream about responsibility, Freud's own responsibility for the failure of his treatment of Irma. This fact alone indicates that responsibility is a crucial Freudian notion. But how are we to conceive it? How are we to avoid the common misperception that the basic ethical message of psychoanalysis is precisely the one of relieving myself of my responsibility, of putting the blame on the other. Since the unconscious is the discourse of the other, I am not responsible for my unconscious formations. It is the big other who speaks through me. I am merely its instrument. Lacan himself pointed the way out of this deadlock by referring to Kant's philosophy as the crucial antecedent of psychoanalytic ethics. According to the standard critique, the limitation of the Kantian universalist ethic of the categorical imperative, the unconditional injunction to do our duty, resides in its formal indeterminacy. The moral law does not tell me what my duty is, it merely tells me that I should accomplish my duty, and so leaves the space open for empty voluntarism. Whatever I decide to be my duty is my duty. 
However, far from being a limitation, this very feature brings us to the core of Kantian ethical autonomy. It is not possible to derive the concrete norms I have to follow in my specific situation from the moral law itself, which means that it is the subject himself who has to assume the responsibility for translating the abstract injunction of the moral law into a series of concrete obligations. The full acceptance of this paradox compels us to reject any reference to duty as an excuse. I know this is heavy and can be painful, but what can I do? This is my duty. Kant's ethics of unconditional duty is often taken as justifying such an attitude. No wonder Adolf Eichmann himself referred to Kantian ethics when he tried to justify his role in planning and executing the Holocaust. He was just doing his duty and obeying the Führer's orders. However, the aim of Kant's emphasis on the subject's full moral autonomy and responsibility is precisely to prevent any such manoeuvre of shifting the blame onto some figure of the big other. So, let us return to Stalin. The commonplace condemnation of Stalin comprises two propositions. One, he was a cynic who knew very well how things stood, that the accused at the show trials were really innocent, and so on. And two, he knew what he was doing, that is, he had full control over the events. Documents from the newly accessible archives rather point in the opposite direction. Stalin basically did believe in the official ideology, in his role as an honest leader, in the guilt of the accused, and so on. And he did not really control the events. The actual results of his own measures and interventions often shocked him. Lars T. Lee proposed a distressing conclusion. The people of the Soviet Union would probably have been better off if Stalin had been more cynical than he was. There is, however, a different way to read Stalin's belief. It is not that he personally believed. He wanted the big other to believe. Lee himself points in this direction when he condones Robert Tucker's amazement at how much pain and suffering went into the mass production of confessions during 1937. These confessions served no earthly purpose. They were promptly filed away and forgotten. Tucker speculates that Stalin insisted on these confessions as proof to posterity that his vision of a world filled with enemies was basically correct. What if, however, we take the statement that the extorted confessions served no earthly purpose more literally? They were filed away and forgotten by actual people because their addressee was not these actual people, but the virtual big other. The same big other that can only account for the well-known incident concerning the great Soviet encyclopedia, which occurred in 1954, immediately after the fall of Beria. When Soviet subscribers received the volume of the encyclopedia, which contained the entries under the letter B, there was, of course, a double-page article on Beria, praising him as the great hero of the Soviet Union. After his fall and denunciation as a traitor and spy, all subscribers received from the publishing house a letter asking them to cut out and return the page on Beria. In exchange, they were promptly sent a double-page entry with photos on the Bering Strait, so that when they inserted it into the volume, its wholeness was re-established. There was no blank to bear witness to the sudden rewriting of history. The mystery here is, for whom was this semblance of wholeness maintained? If every subscriber knew about the manipulation, since he had to perform it himself. The only answer is, of course, for the innocent gaze of the big other. This is why the structure of Stalinism is inherently theological. This is why Stalinism so desperately strived to maintain proper appearances. Such a solution to the enigma also allows us to reject the dilemma, was Stalin a believer or a cynic? As a false one, he was both at the same time. Personally, he, of course, was often aware of the lie in the official discourse. So, personally, he was a cynic. But he was simultaneously quite sincere in his efforts to safeguard the innocence and sincerity of the big other. The modern name for this other, who is supposed to believe, in our stead, is the people. When Golda Meir was asked whether she believed in God, she said, I believe in the Jewish people, and the Jewish people believe in God. One should be very precise in interpreting this statement. It is not implied that the majority of Jews believe in God. As a matter of fact, the state of Israel is arguably the most atheistic country in the world, the only one in which a clear majority of its citizens do not believe in God. What it implies is a certain fetishization of the people. Even if, to go to the extreme, no individual Jewish citizen of Israel believes, 
Each of them presupposes that the people believes, and this presupposition is enough to make her act as if she believes. A Stalinist acts not on behalf of real individuals, but on account of the people, this virtual big other which believes even if no empirical individual believes. In this way, he can combine his individual cynicism with his objective sincerity. He does not have to believe in a cause. He only believes in the people supposed to believe. This brings us to the underlying subjective position of the Stalinist communist, the position of a pervert. A true Stalinist politician loves mankind, but nonetheless performs horrible purges and executions. His heart is breaking while he is doing it, but he cannot help it. It is his duty towards the progress of humanity. This is the perverse attitude of adopting the position of the pure instrument of the big other's will. It is not my responsibility. It is not me who is effectively doing it. I am merely an instrument of the higher historical necessity. As to the genesis of this perverse subjective position, it would be revealing to engage in a detailed account of how the Bolshevik movement related to medicine to the doctors who took care of the leaders. Three documents are crucial here. First are Lenin's letters to Gorky from the fall of 1913, in which, deeply disturbed by Gorky's support for the humanist ideology of God-building, Lenin implies that Gorky has succumbed to this deviation because of his bad nerves, and advises him to go to Switzerland and get the best medical treatment there. In one of the letters, after making it clear how he is shocked at Gorky's ideas. Dear Alexei Maximovich, what are you doing then? Really, it is terrible, simply terrible. Why are you doing this? It is terribly painful. Yours, V.I. Lenin adds a strange postscript. P.S. Take care of yourself more seriously, really, so that you will be able to travel in winter without catching cold. In winter, it is dangerous. Obviously, Lenin is worried that apart from catching cold, Gorky will catch a much more serious ideological disease, as is clear from the subsequent letter posted together with the previous one. Perhaps I don't understand you well. Perhaps you were joking when you wrote for the moment. Concerning the construction of God, perhaps you didn't write that seriously. Good heavens, take care of yourself a little better. Yours, Lenin. What should surprise us here is the way the root of ideological deviation is located in a bodily condition, overexcited nerves, that needs medical treatment. Is it not a bit of supreme irony that in Trotsky's dream from 1935, in which the dead Lenin appears to him, he gives him exactly the same advice? He was questioning me anxiously about my illness. You seem to have accumulated nervous fatigue. You must rest. I answered that I had always recovered from fatigue quickly, thanks to my native Schwungkraft, but that this time the trouble seemed to lie in some deeper processes. Then you should seriously, he emphasized the word, consult the doctors, several names. So to bring this logic to its conclusion, one is tempted to imagine a scene between Lenin and Stalin in the last year of Lenin's life, after his stroke and collapse, when, with his last forces, he ferociously attacks Stalin, and Stalin answers him patronizingly. Good heavens, comrade Lenin, you seem to have accumulated nervous fatigue. You must rest. You should consult the doctors more seriously. Here Lenin would have received his own message in its inverted true form, an appropriate punishment for his mistake. Second, there is Stalin's speech at Lenin's funeral, on the death of Lenin, delivered on January 26, 1924, which begins with, Comrades, we communists are people of a special mould. We are made of a special stuff. We are those who form the army of the great proletarian strategist, the army of Comrade Lenin. There is nothing higher than the honour of belonging to this army. There is nothing higher than the title of member of the party whose founder and leader was Comrade Lenin. It is not given to everyone to be a member of such a party. It is not given to everyone to withstand the stresses and storms that accompany membership in such a party. 
Lenin's obsession with the body of the revolutionary, which for him was merely an idiosyncrasy, is here, as it were, elevated into a concept. A Bolshevik cadre is perceived as the one who possesses a special body, not a body like others, which is why special care should be taken of it, and eventually the body deserves to be preserved in a mausoleum. Third is the fact that Stalin's last paranoid obsession concerned the so-called doctor's plot. All the doctors who were treating him and the top Soviet leadership were arrested and tortured to make them confess that they were part of an international US-Jewish conspiracy to kill the Soviet leadership. Again, the continuity with the previous two points is clear. The doctor's crime was not merely killing their ordinary human patients, but killing the sacred bodies of revolutionary cadres. So what is a cadre? One is tempted to play the Heideggerian game for a brief moment, discerning in cadre the ancient Greek tetragonus, as this word appears at the beginning of a poem by Simonides from the 5th century BC. It is arduous to be an able, a truly able man, in hands and feet, as well as in mind square, tetragonus, without fault. The intermediary link between this Greek notion and the communist one is none other than Kazimir Malevich's black square on white surface. The square figure against the nondescript background. So, to put it in high degrees, the essence of the cadre is to provide a cadre, square, frame, for the essence itself. Far from being a mere metaphor, this notion of the cadre special body is grounded in the logic of objective meaning shared by Lenin and Stalin. While ordinary individuals are caught in historical events which surpass them, blinded to their true meaning, so that their consciousness is false, a revolutionary cadre has access to the true, objective meaning of events, that is, his consciousness is the direct self-consciousness of historical necessity itself. It is this special position that allows him to criticise others in the well-known style of your intentions may be good and your desire to help people sincere, but nonetheless, objectively, what you claim means, in this precise moment of the struggle, support for the reactionary forces. In Hegelese, what this position overlooks is how this objective meaning is already subjectively mediated. It is, for example, when the party decides to change its political line, that the same politics can radically change its objective meaning. Up until the Hitler-Stalin Pact in 1939, Fascism was the principal enemy, while if, after the pact, one continued to focus on the anti-fascist struggle, one objectively served imperialist reaction. And the cadre's sublime body is the ethereal support of this direct self-consciousness of the historical absolute subject. There is nonetheless a crucial rupture here between Lenin and Stalin. While Lenin remained at this level, claiming access to the objective meaning of the events, Stalin took a fateful further step and re-subjectivized the objective meaning. In the Stalinist universe, there are paradoxically ultimately no dupes. Everyone knows the objective meaning of their acts, so that instead of illusory consciousness, we get direct hypocrisy and deceit. The objective meaning of your acts is what you really wanted, and your good intentions are merely a hypocritical mask. Furthermore, all of Lenin cannot be reduced to the subjective position of privileged access to objective meaning. There is another much more open, subjective position at work in Lenin's writings, the position of total exposure to historical contingency. From this position, there is no true party line waiting to be discovered, no objective criteria to determine it. The party makes all possible mistakes, and the true party line emerges out of the zigzag of oscillations. That is, necessity is constituted in praxis. It emerges through the mutual interaction of subjective decisions. Historians who try to demonstrate the continuity between Lenin's politics and Stalinism like to focus on the figure of Felix Zerzinski, the founder of the Cheka, later the CPU, NKVD, KGB, the Bolshevik secret police. As a rule, he is portrayed as what Deleuze would have called the dark precursor of Stalinism, in the precise sense of the term as defined by Ian Buchanan. 
Dark precursors are those moments in a text which must be read in reverse if we are not to mistake effects for causes. In the context of the pre-Stalinist development of the Soviet Union in the first decade after the October Revolution, Zerzhinsky has to be read in reverse. As a voyager who travelled back in time from the Stalinist future a decade ahead. Such a reading often acquires properly phantasmatic dimensions, as in those historians who emphasize Zerzinski's cold blank gaze, allegedly a bodily expression of his ruthless mind, deprived of all human warmth and compassion. No wonder, then, that the West received with chilled surprise the news that the Putin government in Russia decided to return the Zerzinski statue to the square in front of the infamous Lubyanka Palace, the seat of the dreaded KGB. There are, however, some surprises in store for those who cling to this received image. Leslie Chamberlain's The Philosophy Steamer, a book about the expulsion from the Soviet Union in 1921 of the group of most exposed non-Marxist intellectuals, a work which insists precisely on the straight path, if not direct continuity, between Leninism and Stalinism, has an appendix of short biographical notes on all the persons involved. Here is the entry on Zerzhinsky. Felix Zerzinski, 1877 to 1926, Polish-born head of the Cheka, later the GPU, oversaw the expulsions. Zerzinski spent a quarter of his life, 11 years, in Tsarist prisons and Siberian exile, including three years of hard labour. His identification with and championship of the underprivileged and the oppressed, legate, was unquestionable. Zerzinski remains an enigmatic figure. There are many further details which throw an unexpected light on this emblematic figure. However, the point is not primarily to emphasize how much softer, more human, the early Bolsheviks were. One should in no way cover up the harshness of their rule. The point is elsewhere. Precisely when they resorted to terror, and they often did it openly, calling the beast by its name, Red Terror. This terror was different from the Stalinist kind. Of course, many a historian, while ready to concede this point, would nonetheless insist that there was a deeper necessity which led from the first to the second. Is the shift of ruthless revolutionary purity into corrupted terror not a commonplace of the histories of revolutions? No doubt the early Bolsheviks would have been shocked at what the Soviet Union turned into in the 1930s, as many of them were, and were also ruthlessly exterminated in the Great Purges. However, their tragedy was that they were not able to perceive in the Stalinist terror the ultimate offspring of their own acts. What they needed was their own version of the old oriental insight, Tatvam Asi, thou art that. This accepted wisdom, which, let me state clearly, cannot be dismissed as cheap anti-communism. It has its own coherent logic, and it does acknowledge a tragic grandeur in the Bolshevik old guard, is what one should nonetheless render problematic. Here, the left would propose its own alternative to the now fashionable rightist what-if histories. The answer to the eternal leftist query, what would have happened if Lenin had survived ten years longer with his health intact and succeeded in disposing Stalin, is not as clear as it might appear. The liberal would answer basically nothing, that is to say nothing really different, the same Stalinism just deprived of its worst excesses. In spite of many good arguments on its behalf, did Rosa Luxemburg herself, not already back in 1918, foretell the rise of bureaucratic Stalinism. So, although it is clear how Stalinism emerged from the initial conditions of the October Revolution and its immediate aftermath, one should not a priori discount the possibility that, had Lenin stayed healthy for a couple of years and removed Stalin, something entirely different would have emerged, not, of course, the utopia of democratic socialism, but nonetheless something substantially different from Stalinist socialism in one country, the result of a much more pragmatic and improvised series of political and economic decisions, fully aware of its own limitations. Lenin's desperate last struggle against reawakened Russian nationalism, his support for Georgian nationalists, his vision of a much more decentralized federation, and so forth, were not just tactical compromises, they implied a vision of state and society totally incompatible with the Stalinist perspective. Therein resides the importance of Trotsky. Although Trotskyism often functions as a kind of politico-theoretical obstacle, 
preventing the radical self-critical analysis needed by the contemporary left. The figure of Trotsky nonetheless remains crucial inasmuch as it stands for an element which disturbs the alternative, either social democratic socialism or Stalinist totalitarianism. What we find in Trotsky, in his writings and his revolutionary practice in the early years of the Soviet Union, is revolutionary terror, party rule, and so forth, but in a different mode from that of Stalinism. One should thus, in order to remain faithful to Trotsky's real achievements, dispel the popular myths of a warm democratic Trotsky who favoured psychoanalysis, mixed with surrealist artists, and had an affair with Frida Kahlo. And again, the conclusion, even if Trotsky had won, the ultimate result would have been basically the same, or even more, the claim that Trotsky is at the origin of Stalinism, namely that from the late 1920s onwards, Stalinism merely applied and developed measures first envisaged by Trotsky in the early years of war communism, is wrong. History is open. One cannot tell what would have happened if Trotsky had won. The problem lies elsewhere, in the fact that Trotsky's attitude made it impossible for his orientation to win in the struggle for state power. The shift from the Leninism of the 1920s to the Stalinism proper of the 1930s is discernible even at the level of humour in the inner party debates. A certain kind of humour was always part of Bolshevik debates. Lenin himself said at the 11th Party Congress in 1922 that a joke is a very good thing. We cannot make speeches without cracking a joke here and there. This humour was sometimes rough, sarcastic, laced with glacial irony, but still part of a dialogue of party comrades. To quote Hamlet on the way to his mother in Act 3 of the play, I will speak daggers to her, but use none. Furthermore, humour and sarcasm in polemical exchanges were strictly symmetrical. Say, during the debate between the Leninist majority and the workers' opposition in 1921, both sides not only resorted to sarcastic and ironic remarks, but also replied in the same way to their opponents' remarks, by turning them around, extrapolating them to the point of ridicule, and so on. In the 1930s, however, a much more cruel form of sarcasm predominated, which the Soviet press itself called Victor's Laughter, making fun of and laughing at the ridiculous excuses of the impotent and humiliated victims who tried to convince others of their honesty. Examples abound. Vyshinsky, the public prosecutor, shouted at Kamenev and Zinoviev during the famous show trial, drop this clownish farce. When Shmirnov, a defendant of the same trial, denied that he was a terrorist, he was told, the pathetic attempt to wriggle free is quite comical. Along the same lines, the Kafkaesque quality of the eerie laughter that erupted amongst the public during Bukharin's last speech in front of the Central Committee on February the 23rd, 1937, hinges on the radical discord between the speaker's utter seriousness. He is talking about his possible suicide and why he would not commit it since it could hurt the party, but would rather go on with the hunger strike till his death, and the reaction of the Central Committee members. Bukharin. I won't shoot myself because then people will say that I killed myself so as to harm the party. But if I die, as it were, from an illness, then what will you lose by it? Laughter. Voices. Blackmailer. Voroshilov. You scoundrel. Keep your trap shut. How vile. How dare you speak like that. Bukharin. But you must understand, it's very hard for me to go on living. Stalin. And it's easy for us. Voroshilov. Did you hear that? I won't shoot myself, but I will die. Bukharin. It's easy for you to talk about me. What will you lose after all? Look, if I'm a saboteur, a son of a bitch, then why spare me? I make no claims to anything. I am just describing what's on my mind, what I am going through. If this in any way entails any political damage, however minute, then no question about it. I'll do whatever you say. Laughter. Why are you laughing? There is absolutely nothing funny about any of this. The same uncanny laughter also appeared in other places. Bukharin. Whatever they are testifying against me is not true. Laughter, noise in the room. Why are you laughing? There is nothing funny in all this. Do we not have here, enacted in real life, 
the uncanny logic of Joseph K.'s first interrogation in the trial. Well then, said the examining magistrate, turning over the leaves and addressing K. with an air of authority, you are a house painter. No, said K. I am the junior manager of a large bank. This answer evoked such a hearty outburst of laughter from the right party that Kay had to laugh too. People doubled up with their hands on their knees and shook as if in spasms of coughing. In such a universe, of course, there is no place for even the most formal and empty right of subjectivity on which Bukharin continues to insist. Bukharin, I confess that from 1930 to 1932 I committed many political sins. I have come to understand this. But with the same forcefulness with which I confess my real guilt, with that same forcefulness I deny the guilt which is thrust upon me, and I shall deny it forever. And not because it has only personal significance, but because I believe that no one should under any circumstances take upon himself anything superfluous, especially when the party doesn't need it, when the country doesn't need it, when I don't need it. Noise in the room, laughter. The whole tragedy of my situation lies in this, that this Piatikov and others like him so poison the atmosphere, such an atmosphere arose that no one believes human feelings, not emotions, not the impulses of the heart, not tears, laughter. Many manifestations of human feeling, which had earlier represented a form of proof, and there was nothing shameful in this, have today lost their validity and force. Kaganovich, you practice too much duplicity. Bukharin. Comrades, let me say the following concerning what happened. Kloplyankin. It's time to throw you in prison. Bukharin. What? Kloplyankin. You should have been thrown in prison a long time ago. Bukharin. Well, go on, throw me in prison. So you think the fact that you were yelling throw him in prison will make me talk differently? No, it won't. It is easy to see how this shift in humour depends on the passage from the Leninist notion of the objective meaning of one's acts to its Stalinist re-subjectivization. Since, in the Stalinist universe, there are ultimately no dupes, and everyone knows the objective meaning of their acts, disagreement with the official party line can only be the result of direct hypocrisy and deceit. What is more surprising is the readiness of Western communist observers to perceive this hypocrisy as a true psychological fact about the accused. In a letter to Benjamin from 1938, Adorno reports a conversation he had with Hans Eisler in New York. I listened with not a little patience to his feeble defence of the Moscow trials, and with considerable disgust to the joke he cracked about the murder of Bukharin. He claims to have known the latter in Moscow, telling me that Bukharin's conscience was already so bad that he could not even look him, Eisler, honestly in the eyes. Eisler's psychological blindness is staggering here. He misreads Bukharin's terror, fearing contact with foreigners, knowing that he is under observation and close to arrest, as an inner feeling of guilt. Shostakovich in Casablanca. Although, of course, the perverse position of the instrument of the big other was reserved for the members of the nomenclatura, ordinary Soviet citizens were not reduced to the simple alternative of believers or non-believers. The split that characterized their predominant subjective position was of a different nature. Recall the debate about the true message of Shostakovich's work that raged in musicological circles until recently. Where did the composer truly stand with regard to his obviously tortured relationship to communism? The two opposed positions are that, in spite of all his obvious doubts and oscillations, Shostakovich was a faithful Soviet composer, or that in fact Shostakovich was a closet dissident whose music presents disguised or coded challenges to the very political system he pretended to endorse. In the second case, we get caught in the interpretive madness in which every feature can be interpreted as a sign of its opposite. Complain that the triumphant ending of the Leningrad Symphony was banal, and you might get the response, ah, but it's meant to be banal. The message conveyed was what mattered. 
it is thus only a thin line of reflexivity that separates the two readings. If banality is self-declaratory, if it is meant as such, then it cancels itself and reverts into irony. Where then does the truth reside? What I propose is a Hegelian synthesis of these opposed views, albeit a synthesis with an unexpected twist. What if what makes Shostakovich's music Stalinist, part of the Soviet universe, is his very distance towards it? What if a distance towards the official ideological universe, far from undermining it, was a key constituent of its functioning? Shostakovich's spontaneously intimate attitude towards politics is probably best expressed in his remark to a friend. Do you not think that history is really a horror? This generalized distrust of all politics, which also grounds his distance towards dissidents, such as Solzhenitsyn, made his survival much easier. The crucial insight compels us to give a specific twist to the standard argument for Shostakovich's dissidents. Even the most official writers were, more often than not, privately sceptical about the Soviet regime and known to be within the dissident culture. It is indeed rare to find Russian writers under Soviet rule, however officially sanctioned or ostensibly conformist, who did not, at one time or other, voice a critical outlook on Soviet reality. Shostakovich was also uniquely active in forwarding dissident values in his work, an enterprise substantially protected by the deniability inherent in non-verbal dissidents. But he was in no sense alone in privately maintaining a dissenting outlook on Soviet life, while at the same time necessarily giving a contrary public impression of conformism. So why did Stalin not liquidate Shostakovich and many other leading figures from Akhmatova to Pasternak, whose views were transparently dissident. In the case of poets, Stalin's superstition seems to have played a part, but the main answer is that major figures could not be liquidated without causing foreign uproar. It looks really bad for a line of reasoning which has to go so far as to evoke Stalin's superstition. Is it not much easier and more logical to admit that the gap between public allegiance to the regime and private dissidence was part of the very identity of the Stalinist subject. If there is a lesson to be learned from the functioning of Stalinist ideology, it is that public appearances matter, which is why one should reserve the category dissidents exclusively for the public discourse. Dissidents were only those who disturbed the smooth functioning of the public discourse, announcing publicly, in one way or another, what privately everybody already knew. Was, however, such a subjective position the only one possible, if one wanted to survive, of course? The fate of Sergei Prokofiev, the other great name of Soviet music, shows a radically different path. In his disputed memoirs, Dmitry Shostakovich dismissed Sergei Prokofiev, his great competitor, as refusing to take historical horrors seriously always playing the wise guy. However, to name just one supreme example, Prokofiev's first violin sonata, Opus 80, clearly demonstrates the obverse of Prokofiev's infamous irony. Throughout its four movements, one senses a powerful undertow of struggle. Yet it is not the struggle of a work against something outside itself, but rather the struggle of something within the work, unmanifested trying desperately to break out and constantly finding its emergence blocked by the existing outward form and language of the piece. This blocking of something within has to do with the frustration of a desire for cathartic release into some supremely positive state of being where meaning, musical and supramusical, is transparent, unironizable. In short, a domain of spiritual purity. It is here that Prokofiev pays the price for his ironic stance, and it is such passages that bear witness to his artistic integrity. Far from signalling any kind of vain intellectual superiority, this ironic stance is just the falsely bright obverse of the failure of Prokofiev's constant struggle to bring the thing from inner space, 
the something within, out. The superficial playfulness of some of Prokofiev's works, such as his popular First Symphony, merely signals in a negative way the fact that Prokofiev is the ultimate anti-Mozart, a kind of Beethoven whose titanic struggle ended in disaster. If Mozart was the supreme musical genius, perhaps the last composer with whom the musical thing transposed itself into musical notes in a spontaneous flow, and if in Beethoven a piece only achieved its definitive form after a long, heroic struggle with the musical material, Prokofiev's greatest pieces are monuments to the defeat of this struggle. Shostakovich never reached the level of such an imminent failure. His piece, which can be compared to Prokofiev's first violin sonata, in its exceptional subjectively engaged intensity, is, of course, his string quartet number eight. And the difference between the two pieces is striking. Whatever subjective anguish is detectable beneath the quartet, its musical expression flows unhindered, pouring out and generating an easily recognizable emotional impact. Shostakovich's life and subjective experience may have been thwarted, marked by depressions and terrible and debasing compromises, but this blockade does not affect his musical expression. In Prokofiev's violin sonata, on the contrary, we are dealing with a much more radical imminent blockage of musical expression itself. The tragic failure is here the failure of the form itself, and this failure accounts for the inner truth missing in Shostakovich. In the last decade and a half of his life, Prokofiev was caught up in the Stalinist superego at its purest. Whatever he did was wrong. When he stuck to his modernist roots, he was accused of anti-people formalism and bourgeois decadence. When, thereafter, he tried to do his best to bow to the pressure in his infamous cantata for the 20th anniversary of the October Revolution, using texts by Marx, Lenin and Stalin, the cantata was again criticised for leftist deviation and vulgarity. That is, for dragging Marx and Lenin into it. Desperate to contribute something, anything, to the 20th anniversary, Prokofiev quickly threw together a concoction of folk tunes and party sing-alongs entitled Songs of Our Days. The work was again dismissed as pale and lacking in individuality, which, of course, was true. Prokofiev must by now have been utterly bewildered. If he wrote like a simpleton, he was a depersonalized left deviationist. If he wrote like Prokofiev, he was a mercenary formalist. Individual, non-individual, there must have seemed no rhyme or reason to it, and of course, none existed. But there definitely was a rhyme and reason to it, the rhyme and reason of the Stalinist superego, in the eyes of which one is always guilty. However, the problem was a deeper one. The paradox of Prokofiev's late style was that the logic of his imminent musical development, which led him away from expressionist pathos towards new simplicity, strangely reverberated with the official demands for the easy listening music accessible to ordinary Soviet people. In the case of Prokofiev, as well as in that of Shostakovich, the reason why critics so desperately look for the ultimate proof of secret dissidence is to avoid a highly embarrassing truth. Their most popular works today in the West overlap to a surprising degree with the very works which got the greatest official, not only popular support, from the regime. Shostakovich's 5th, 7th and 11th symphonies, Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf, and the Romeo and Juliet Ballet. Even among Shostakovich's chamber music, his piano quintet, which got the Stalin Prize in 1940, is his most popular piece. How can this be? Here enters the hermeneutics of dissidence, which shows the escape route. Shostakovich's 5th symphony, the most often performed 20th century symphony also in the West. It has to be the case that the triumphant finale is really meant ironically, mocking the emptiness of Stalinist triumphalism. The enduring popularity of the Seventh Symphony, the Leningrad, it has to be that the inexorable brutal marching progress in the first movement does not really refer to the German conquest of Russia in 1941, but to the communist conquest of Russia. Shostakovich's Eleventh Symphony 1905, a hit? It has to be quickly confirmed that 1905 is just a pretext, that the revolutionary explosion really refers to Hungary in 1956. But what about the Shostakovich symphonies, which were effectively unacceptable for those in power, like the 13th, 
Babi Yar, and the last, the 15th. The answer is clear. In a supreme twist of irony, the 13th caused such a stir at its premiere precisely and only because of the political circumstances. It functioned as a gesture of political defiance, not because of its artistic strength. These works are today respected and praised, but not really enjoyed. The publicity text for the new recording of Shostakovich's first violin concerto by Leila Josefovich says that she pays homage to the struggle Shostakovich faced under Stalin's regime. The patent absurdity of this claim confirms Michael Tanner's thesis that there is almost no other composer for whom the life and works melange has achieved such orthodox status. Tanner is fully justified in pointing out how the endless debates regarding how some symphony movements are to be read, with serious pathos or as ironic subversion, or regarding which victorious finales are meant to render the victories pyrrhic, tell us in fact what the music itself fails to achieve. There is no greater monument to Shostakovich's artistic failure than the obsessive search for some private, extra-artistic document that would definitely prove his intimate anti-communist stance. This is why, in the ambiguities in which this politically engaged background no longer resonates, Shostakovich's music is simply uninterestingly enigmatic. Like the references to Rossini and Wagner in The Last Symphony, there is no deeper meaning to be discovered here. The enigma is musically flat. The irony here is that the very search for the extra-musical smoking gun demonstrates the truth of the Stalinist accusation about the formalist character of Shostakovich's music. Not, of course, in the sense in which it was intended by Zhdanov, a consort, but in the sense that his music is neutral with regard to social commitments, which is why one has to look for extra musical signs to pin it down. So what if we read Shostakovich's popular symphonies along the lines of how we might read one of the great Hollywood classics? In the well-known brief scene three quarters into Casablanca, Ilse Lund, Ingrid Bergman, comes to Rick Blaine's Humphrey Bogart's room, to try to obtain the letters of transit that will allow her and her resistance leader husband, Victor Lajlo, to escape from Casablanca to Portugal, and then to America. After Rick refuses to hand them over, she pulls a gun and threatens him. He tells her, go ahead and shoot, you'll be doing me a favour. She breaks down and tearfully starts to tell him the story of why she left him in Paris. By the time, she says, if you knew how much I loved you, how much I still love you, they are embracing in a close-up. The movie dissolves into a three-and-a-half-second shot of the airport tower at night, its searchlights circling, and then dissolves back to a shot from outside the window of Rick's room, where he is standing, looking out and smoking a cigarette. He turns round and says, and then? She resumes her story. The question that immediately pops up here, of course, is what happened in between, during the three-and-a-half-second shot of the airport? Did they do it or not? Maltby is right to emphasise that, as to this point, the film is not simply ambiguous. It rather generates two very clear, although mutually exclusive, meanings. They did it, and they did not do it. That is, the film gives unambiguous signals that they did it, and simultaneously unambiguous signals that they cannot have done it. On the one hand, a series of codified features signal that they did do it, namely that the three-and-a-half-second shot stands for a longer period of time. The dissolve of the couple passionately embracing usually signals the act after the fade-out. The cigarette is also the standard sign of post-coital relaxation, up to the vulgar phallic connotation of the tower. On the other hand, a parallel series of features signals that they did not do it, namely that the three-and-a-half-second shot of the airport tower corresponds to the real diegetic time, the bed in the background is undisturbed. The same conversation seems to go on without a break, and so on. Even when, in the final conversation between Rick and Lajlo at the airport, they directly touch on the events of this night, their words can be read in both ways. Rick. You said you knew about Ilsa and me. Victor. Yes. Rick. You didn't know she was at my place last night when you were. She came there for the letters of transit. Isn't that true, Ilsa? Ilsa, yes. Rick, she tried everything to get them, and nothing worked. She did her best to convince me that she was still in love with me. That was all over long ago. That was all over long ago. For your sake, she pretended it wasn't, and I let her pretend. 
Victor, I understand. Well, I certainly do not understand. Is Rick saying to Victor that he made love to his wife or not? Maltby's solution is to insist that this scene provided an exemplary case of how Casablanca deliberately constructs itself in such a way as to offer distinct and alternative sources of pleasure to two people sitting next to each other in the same cinema. That is, that it could play to both innocent and sophisticated audiences alike. While at the level of its surface narrative line, the film can be constructed by the spectator as obeying the strictest moral codes, it simultaneously offers to the sophisticated enough clues to construct an alternative, sexually much more daring narrative line. This strategy is more complex than it may appear, precisely because you knew that you are, as it were, covered or absolved from guilty impulses by the official storyline. You are allowed to indulge in dirty fantasies. You know that these fantasies are not serious, that they do not count in the eyes of the big other. So our only correction to Maltby would be that we do not need two spectators sitting next to each other. One and the same spectator, split in two, is sufficient. To put it in Lacanian terms, during the infamous three and a half seconds, Ilsa and Rick did not do it for the big other, the order of public appearance, but they did do it for our dirty, phantasmatic imagination. This is the structure of inherent transgression at its purest, that is, Hollywood needs both levels in order to function. To put it in terms of the discourse theory elaborated by Oswald Ducrot, we have here the opposition between presupposition and surmise. The presupposition of a statement is directly endorsed by the big other. We are not responsible for it, while the responsibility for the surmise of a statement rests entirely on the reader's, or spectator's, shoulders. The author of the text can always claim, it's not my responsibility if the spectators draw dirty conclusions from the texture of the film. And, to link this to psychoanalytic terms, this opposition is, of course, the opposition between symbolic law, the ego ideal, and the obscene superego. At the level of the public symbolic law, nothing happens. The text is clean, while at another level, it bombards the spectator with the superego injunction, enjoy. That is, give way to your dirty imagination. To put it in yet another way, what we encounter here is a clear example of the fetishistic split, of the disavowal structure of je sais bien, mais quand même. The very awareness that they did not do it gives free rein to your dirty imagination. You can indulge in it because you are absolved from the guilt by the fact that, for the big other, they definitely did not do it. And this double reading is not simply a compromise on the part of the law, in the sense that the symbolic law is interested only in keeping up appearances and leaves you free to exercise your fantasies, insofar as they do not encroach upon the public domain, namely insofar as they save the appearances. The law itself needs its obscene supplement. It is sustained by it, so it generates it. Mobby is thus right in emphasising that the infamous Hollywood production code of the 1930s and 1940s was not simply a negative censorship code, but also a positive, productive, as Foucault would have put it, codification and regulation that generated the very excess whose direct depiction it hindered. Indicative here is the conversation between Josef von Sternberg and Breen, reported by Maltby, when Sternberg said, at this point, the two principles have a brief romantic interlude. Breen interrupted him. What you're trying to say is that the two of them hopped into the hay. They fucked. The indignant Sternberg answered, Mr. Breen, you offend me. Breen, oh, for Christ's sakes, will you stop the horseshit and face the issue? We can help you make a story about adultery if you want, but not if you keep calling a good screwing match a romantic interlude. Now, what do these two people do? Kiss and go home? No, said Sternberg. They fuck. Good, yelped Breen, pounding the desk. Now I can understand your story. The director completed his outline, and Breen told him how he could handle it in such a way as to get past the code. So the very prohibition, in order to function properly, has to rely on a clear awareness about what really happened at the level of the prohibited narrative line. The production code did not simply prohibit some content, it rather codified its ciphered articulation. And back to Shostakovich, what if exactly the same holds for his popular symphonies? What if they also operate at two levels simultaneously, one public, 
intended for the ruling ideological gaze, and another which transgresses the public rules, but remains as such its inherent supplement. One can thus appreciate the ambiguity of these lines. Since the Stalinist assault against his music in 1936, Shostakovich had developed a sort of doublespeak in his musical language, using one idiom to please his masters in the Kremlin, and another to satisfy his own moral conscience as an artist and citizen. Outwardly he spoke in a triumphant voice, yet beneath the ritual sounds of Soviet rejoicing there was a softer, more melancholic voice, the carefully concealed voice of satire and dissent, only audible to those who had felt the suffering his music expressed. These two voices are clearly audible in Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, which received a half-hour ovation of electrifying force when it was first performed. Beneath the endless fanfares, trumpeting the triumph of the Soviet state in the finale, the audience must have felt its sadness, and they responded to the music as a spiritual release. A strange hermeneutics indeed, a carefully concealed voice which is nonetheless clearly understood by thousands. Were the official censors really so stupid as not to get it? So what if we read the fragile coexistence of these two idioms along the lines of the ambiguity inscribed into the night encounter scene from Casablanca? What if the Stalinist rejection of both Prokofiev's propagandistic and intimate works was right on its own terms? What if what they wanted from him was precisely the coexistence of two levels, propagandistic and intimate, while he was offering them either the first or the second? After World War II, Prokofiev withdrew increasingly to the intimate domain of chamber music, where he could find expression for his private sadness. Was this an act of silent defiance? writing music for the drawer, as Shostakovich would have put it. How is it then that the most moving and desperate of these works, his violin sonata in D major, whose haunting opening movement was meant to sound like the wind in a graveyard, was awarded the Stalin Prize in 1947? Orlando Figues claims that the award was meant ironically, but what kind of strange irony is this? Let us return to Shostakovich. Can we really be so sure that the public bombast music is meant ironically, while the intimate confessional mood is meant sincerely? What if the irony is objective, and we have to read this music in the same way Marx read the attitude of the party of order in the French Parliament after the 1848 revolution? Recall Marx's coruscating analysis of how this conservative Republican Party functioned as the coalition of the two branches of royalism, Orleanists and Legitimists, in the anonymous kingdom of the Republic. The parliamentary deputies of the Party of Order perceived their republicanism as mockery. In parliamentary debates, they generated royalist slips of the tongue and ridiculed the Republic to let it be known that their true aim was to restore the king. What they were not aware of is that they themselves were duped as to the true social impact of their rule. They unknowingly established the conditions of the bourgeois republican order that they despise so much by, for instance, guaranteeing private property. So it is not that they were royalists who were just wearing republican masks. Although they thought of themselves as such, it was their inner royalist conviction which was the deceptive front masking their true social role. In short, far from being the hidden truth of their public republicanism, their sincere royalism was the phantasmatic support of their actual republicanism. It was what provided the passion for their activity. Is it not then that the deputies of the party of order were also feigning to feign to be Republicans, to be what they really were, in exactly the same way that Shostakovich was feigning to feign to be a faithful communist? Nonetheless, the subjective position of Prokofiev is here radically different from that of Shostakovich. One can propose the thesis that, in contrast to Shostakovich, Prokofiev was effectively not a Soviet composer even if he wrote more than Shostakovich's share of official cantatas celebrating Stalin and his regime. Prokofiev adopted a kind of proto-psychotic position of internal exclusion towards Stalinism. He was not internally affected or bothered by it, that is, he treated it as just an external nuisance. There was effectively something childish in Prokofiev, like the refusal of a spoilt child to accept one's place in the social order of things. He returned to the Soviet Union in 1936 at the height of the Stalinist purges, drove around in his imported American car, dressed eccentrically in fancy clothes delivered from Paris, 
ordered books and food from the West, ignoring the madness and poverty around him. This is why, in contrast to Shostakovich, he never really got into the Stalinist superego double-talk idiom of combining external accommodation with inner bitterness and sadness. Even the melancholy and despair of his late violin sonata is not a reaction to Stalinist oppression. The same style and mood are there already in his pre-revolutionary works. The different reaction of the two composers to Zhidanov's attacks in 1946-47 is exemplary here. Bukoviev simply did not understand what the charges were about. He did not internalize the tension. When, in 1947, he was forced to attend a meeting of the Composers' Union and to listen to Zhidanov's speech attacking him and other Soviet composers, he arrived drunk, made loud, rude comments interrupting the speech, and then fell asleep on his chair in the midst of it. Miraculously, nothing happened. So accepted was his eccentricity. And Shostakovich? The popularity and public resonance of his music underwent a weird change. A couple of decades ago, the majority of critics dismissed him as a socialist realist, out of touch with the proper development of modern music. However, today, the great musical modernists such as Schoenberg and Webern are perceived as a thing of the past, respectfully ignored, while Shostakovich has emerged as arguably the most popular, serious composer of the 20th century. Dozens of volumes were written not only about his music, but also about his closet dissidents. What if, however, Shostakovich's popularity is the sign of a non-event, of the occultation of the true event of modern music? Broadly, a moment of the vast cultural counter-revolution whose political mark is the withdrawal from radical emancipatory politics and the refocusing on human rights and the prevention of suffering. The Stalinist Carnival What did the trauma of 1935, the public campaign against his Lady Macbeth, triggered by the Pravda article, Muddle Instead of Music, do to his music? Perhaps the clearest indicator of the break is the change in the function of the Scherzo in Shostakovich's work in the 1940s and early 1950s. Prior to 1935, his scherzos can still be perceived as the explosive expression of new aggressive and grotesque vitality and joie de vivre. There is something of the liberating force of the carnival in them, of the madness of the creative power that merrily sweeps away all obstacles and ignores all established roles and hierarchies. After 1935, however, his scherzos had clearly lost their innocence. Their explosive energy acquires a brutal, threatening quality. There is something mechanical in their energy, like the forced movements of a marionette. They either render the raw energy of social violence, of massacres of helpless victims, or, if they are meant as the explosion of the joy of life, this is clearly intended in a sarcastic way, or as an impotent, maniacal outburst of the aggressivity of the helpless victim. The carnival is here no longer a liberating experience, but the flash of thwarted and repressed aggression. It is the carnival of racist pogroms and drunken gang rapes. The outstanding cases are the second and third movements of the Eighth Symphony, the famous second movement of the Tenth Symphony, Portrait of Stalin, and among the string quartets, the third movement of Quartet Number no. 3, which today almost sounds like Hermann's score for Psycho, and the Furioso movement of Quartet Number no. 10. Does this mean that, in a disturbing way, the traumatic experience of Stalinist condemnation helped Shostakovich to achieve his bitter maturity. Would he otherwise have remained a composer of the new Soviet joie de vivre, mixing jazz with aggressive rhythmic modernism? What if the mixture of melancholic oppressive drama and the destructive scherzo explosions is not the only way to reply to the experience of Stalinist terror, but rather a reply that fits in with Stalinist humanism, its reaffirmation of the old Russian tradition? What if there is a different way which is also already prefigured in another old Russian tradition? The overlapping of horror and humour as the sign of distinction of the specifically Russian grotesque whose first great representative was Gogol. What is The Nose, his most famous short story about a low-level bureaucrat whose nose becomes detached and acquires a life of its own, other than a grotesque comedy or a horror story? Indicative is here the reception of Shostakovich's early absurdist short opera, 1930, based on this story. Although it is usually played as a satire, 
or even a frenetic farce. Shostakovich himself called it a horror story. I tried not to make jokes in the nose. It's too cruel. So when the opera group, which recently staged it, called it, in their production leaflet, the funniest opera ever, an operatic version of Monty Python, this designation should remind us of the underlying nightmarish dimension of Monty Python's comedy. Such a mixture of horror and humour is a trademark of the concentration camp universe. This is how Primo Levi in If This Is A Man describes the dreadful Selexia, the survival examination in the camp. The Blockal tester, the elder of the hut, has closed the connecting door and has opened the other two, which lead from the dormitory and the Tagesraum, day room, outside. Here, in front of the two doors, stands the arbiter of our fate, an SSD subaltern. On his right is the Blockal tester, on his left the quartermaster of the hut. Each one of us, as he comes naked out of the Tagesraum into the cold October air, has to run the few steps between the two doors, give the card to the SS man, and enter the dormitory door. The SS man, in the fraction of a second between two successive crossings, with a glance at one's back and front, judges everyone's fate, and in turn gives the card to the man on his right or his left, and this is the life or death of each of us. In three or four minutes, a hut of 200 men is done as is the whole camp of 12,000 men in the course of an afternoon. Right means survival, left means the gas chambers. Is there not something properly comic in this? The ridiculous spectacle of trying to appear strong and healthy to attract for a brief moment the indifferent gaze of the Nazi administrator who presides over life and death. Here, comedy and horror coincide. Imagine the prisoners practicing their appearance, trying to hold their heads high and push their chests forward, walking briskly, pinching their lips to appear less pale, exchanging advice on how to impress the SS man. Imagine how a simple momentary confusion of cards or a lack of attention of the SS man can decide their fate. No wonder, then, that obscene humour is also a key indicator of the carnivalesque dimension of Stalinist terror. Recall the adventure of Shostakovich's interrogation by the KGB in 1937. I was given a security pass and went to the AKVD office. The investigator got up when I came in and greeted me. He was very friendly and asked me to sit down. He started asking questions about my health, my family, the work I was doing, all kinds of questions. He spoke in a very friendly, welcoming and polite way. Then suddenly he asked me, so tell me, do you know Tukhachevsky? I said yes, and he said how. So then I said, at one of my concerts. After the concert, Tukhachevsky came backstage to congratulate me. He said he liked my music, that he was an admirer. He said he'd like to meet me when he came to Leningrad to talk about music. He said it would be a pleasure to discuss music with me. He said if I came to Moscow, he'd be happy to see me. And how often did you meet? Only when Tukhachevsky came here. He usually invited me for dinner. Who else was at the table? Just his family, his family and relatives. And what did you discuss? Mostly music, not politics. No, we never talked politics. I knew how things were. Dmitri Dmitrievich, this is very serious. You must remember. Today is Saturday. I'll sign your pass and you can go home. But on Monday noon, you must be here. Don't forget that. This is very serious, very important. I understood this was the end. Those two days until Monday were a nightmare. I told my wife I probably wouldn't return. She even prepared a bag for me, the kind prepared for people who were taken away. She put in warm underwear. She knew I wouldn't be back. I went back there at noon on Monday and reported to reception. There was a soldier there. I gave him my internal passport. I told him I'd been summoned. He looked for my name, first, second, third list. He said, who summoned you? I said, Inspector Zakovsky. He said, he won't be able to see you today. Go home, we'll notify you. He returned my passport and I went home. It was only later that evening that I learned that the inspector had been arrested. 
If there was ever a carnival in which today you are a king and tomorrow a beggar, this was it. A common sense reproach nonetheless imposes itself here. Is there not a rather obvious fundamental difference between the carnival proper and the Stalinist purges? In the first case, the entire social hierarchy is momentarily suspended. Those who are up are cast down, and vice versa. While in the case of Stalinism, the unexpected and irrational changes of fortune affect only those who are subjected to power. Far from being threatened, far from its power being even symbolically suspended, the communist nomenclatura uses the irrational shifts of arbitrary terror to fortify its rule. There are, however, moments of paroxysm in which revolutionary terror effectively reaches carnivalesque dimensions. Moments in which, like the proverbial snake, the ruling party starts to eat itself, gradually swallowing its own tail. The surprising fact that the most dangerous place to be was close to the centres of power clearly distinguishes Stalinism from fascist regimes. Here are the results of the mere two years of Yezhovskina. Five of Stalin's Politburo colleagues were killed, and 98 out of 139 Central Committee members. Of the Central Committee of the Ukraine Republic, only three out of 200 survived. 72 of the 93 members of the Komsomol Organization Central Committee perished. Out of 1,996 party leaders at the 17th Congress in 1934, 1,108 were imprisoned or murdered. In the provinces, 319 out of 385 regional party secretaries and 2,210 out of 2,750 district secretaries died. In his analysis of the paranoia of the German judge Schreber, Freud reminds us that what we usually consider as madness, the paranoid scenario of the conspiracy against the subject, is effectively already an attempt at recovery. After the complete psychotic breakdown, the paranoid construct is an attempt by the subject to re-establish a kind of order in his universe, a frame of reference enabling him to acquire a form of cognitive mapping. Along the same lines, one is tempted to claim that when, in late 1937, the Stalinist paranoid discourse reached its apogee and set in motion its own dissolution as a social link, the 1938 arrest and liquidation of Yezhov himself, Stalin's main executioner in 1937, was effectively the attempt at recovery, at stabilising the uncontrolled fury of self-destruction that broke out in 1937. The purge of Yezhov was a kind of meta-purge, the purge to end all purges. He was accused precisely of killing thousands of innocent Bolsheviks on behalf of foreign powers. The irony being that the accusation was literally true, he did organise the killing of the thousands of innocent Bolsheviks. However, the crucial point is that, although we are here reaching the limits of the social, the level at which the social symbolic link itself approaches its self-destructive dissolution, this excess itself was nonetheless generated by a precise dynamic of social struggle, by a series of shifting alignments and realignments at the very top of the regime, Stalin and his narrow circle, the upper nomenclatura and the rank-and-file party members. Thus, in 1933 and 1935, Stalin and the Politburo united with all levels of the nomenclatura elite to screen or purge a helpless rank-and-file. The regional leaders then used those purges to consolidate their machines and expel inconvenient people. This in turn brought another alignment in 1936 in which Stalin and the Moscow nomenclatura sided with the rank and file, who complained of repression by the regional elites. In 1937, Stalin openly mobilised the party masses against the nomenclatura as a whole. This provided an important strand in the great terrorist destruction of the elite. But in 1938, the Politburo changed alignments and reinforced the authority of the regional nomenclatura as part of an attempt to restore order in the party during the terror. The situation thus exploded when Stalin made the risky move of directly appealing to the lower rank and file members themselves, soliciting them to articulate their complaint against the arbitrary rule of the local party bosses, a move similar to Mao's Cultural Revolution. Their fury at the regime, unable to express itself directly, exploded all the more viciously against the personalised substitute targets. 
since the upper nomenclatura at the same time retained its executive power in the purges themselves, this set in motion a properly carnivalesque, self-destructive vicious cycle, in which virtually everyone was threatened. For example, of 82 district party secretaries, 79 were shot. Another aspect of the spiralling vicious cycle was the very fluctuations of the directives from the top as to the thoroughness of the purges. The top demanded harsh measures, while at the same time warning against excesses. So the executors were put in an untenable position. Ultimately, whatever they did was wrong. If they did not arrest a sufficient number of traitors and discover enough conspiracies, they were considered lenient and supportive of counter-revolution. So under this pressure, in order to meet the quota, as it were, they had to fabricate evidence and invent plots, thereby exposing themselves to the criticism that they were themselves saboteurs, destroying thousands of honest communists on behalf of foreign powers. Stalin's strategy of addressing directly the party masses, co-opting their anti-bureaucratic attitudes, was thus very risky. This not only threatened to open elite politics to public scrutiny, but also risked discrediting the entire Bolshevik regime, of which Stalin himself was a part. Finally, in 1937, Stalin broke all the rules of the game, indeed destroyed the game completely, and unleashed a terror of all against all. One can discern very precisely the superego dimension of these events. This very violence inflicted by the Communist Party on its own members bears witness to the radical self-contradiction of the regime, namely to the fact that, at the origins of the regime, there was an authentic revolutionary project. Incessant purges were necessary not only to erase the traces of the regime's own origins, but also as a kind of return of the repressed, a reminder of the radical negativity at the heart of the regime. The Stalinist purges of high party echelons relied on this fundamental betrayal. The accused were effectively guilty insofar as they, as the members of the new nomenclature, betrayed the revolution. The Stalinist terror is thus not simply the betrayal of the revolution, that is the attempt to erase the traces of the authentic revolutionary past. It rather bears witness to a kind of imp of perversity which compels the post-revolutionary new order to re-inscribe its betrayal of the revolution within itself, to reflect it or remark it in the guise of arbitrary arrests and killings which threatened all members of the nomenclature. As in psychoanalysis, the Stalinist confession of guilt conceals the true guilt. As is well known, Stalin wisely recruited into the NKVD people of lower social origins who were thus able to act out their hatred of the nomenclature by arresting and torturing senior apparatchiks. This inherent tension between the stability of the rule of the new nomenclature and the perverted return of the oppressed in the guise of the repeated purges of the ranks of the nomenclature is at the very heart of the Stalinist phenomenon. Purges are the very form in which the betrayed revolutionary heritage survives and haunts the regime. As already noted in the case of Mao, one should specify here the role of the leader. He was exempted from these shifts of fortune because he was not the traditional master, but the lord of misrule, the very agent of carnivalesque subversion. Because of this carnivalesque self-destructive dynamic, the Stalinist nomenclature cannot yet be characterized as the new class. As Andrei Waliki noted, paradoxically, the stabilization of nomenclature into a new class is incompatible with true Stalinist totalitarianism. It was only in the Brezhnev years that this occurred. Quote, the consolidation of the Soviet nomenclature, which for the first time in Soviet history succeeded in emancipating itself from the subservience to higher authorities and constituted itself as a stable privileged stratum enjoying not only physical security, which it had obtained under Khrushchev, but also job security, regardless of performance, in effect a status similar to that of the new ruling class. The high watermark of totalitarianism was the period of the permanent purges, which aimed at the absolute elimination, not only of all possible deviations, but also of stable interest groups whose very existence might endanger ideological purity and undermine the monolithic structure of power.
there are two further paradoxical conclusions to be drawn here. Due to the specific ideological nature of the Stalinist regime, its nominal commitment to the goal of an egalitarian and just communist society, the terror and purges of the nomenclature itself were not only inscribed into its very nature, the very existence of nomenclature betrayed its proclaimed goals. They were also the revenge of the regime's own ideology against its nomenclature, which was indeed guilty of betraying socialism. Furthermore, this is why the full stabilization of the nomenclature into a new class was only possible when its members ceased to take seriously the regime's ideological goals. Therein resides the role of the term really existing socialism, which emerged during the Brezhnev years. It signals that the regime had renounced its communist vision and limited itself to pragmatic power politics. This also confirms the often noted fact that the Khrushchev years were the last years in which the Soviet ruling elite was still possessed by a genuine historical, if not revolutionary, enthusiasm about its own mission. After Khrushchev, nothing like his defiant message to the Americans, we will bury you, your grandchildren will be communists, was imaginable. The Stalinist Carnival in the films of Sergei Eisenstein Besides Wells' magnificent Ambersons, Eisenstein's Bezhen Meadow and Part 3 of Ivan the Terrible belong to the series of lost absolute masterpieces of the history of cinema. The supreme irony of Bezhen Meadow is the film's title. It is taken from Ivan Turgenev's short story, one of the sketches from a hunter's album, about peasant boys discussing supernatural signs of death. What does this have to do with the film's story, based on the infamous case of Pavlik Morozov, about a boy from a peasant village in the years of dekulakization, who is killed by his counter-revolutionary father because he supported collective farms? One is almost tempted to repeat the question of the perplexed viewer in front of a painting showing Nadezda Krupskaya in her office, engaged in wild sex with a young Komsomol member, entitled Lenin in Warsaw. Where is Lenin? The guide's calm reply, Lenin is in Warsaw. So where is Bezhin Meadow? There are echoes between the two stories, but not at the explicit narrative level. They concern the underlying phantasmatic virtual level, in the film, too, there is a group of peasant boys struggling with the earthly representative of the supernatural, the church. But they discuss supernatural signs of death by destroying it in a carnivalesque orgy. It was the greatness of Eisenstein that, in his films, he rendered the shift in the libidinal economy from the Leninist revolutionary fervor to the Stalinist thermidor. Recall the archetypal Eisensteinian cinematic scene, which portrays the exuberant orgy of revolutionary destructive violence, which Eisenstein himself called a veritable bacchanalia of destruction. When, in October, the victorious revolutionaries penetrate the wine cellars of the Winter Palace, they indulge in an ecstatic orgy of smashing thousands of expensive wine bottles. In Beige and Meadow, the village pioneers force their way into the local church and desecrate it, robbing it of its relics, squabbling over an icon, sacrilegiously trying on vestments, heretically laughing at the statuary. In this suspension of goal-oriented instrumental activity, we effectively have a kind of bataillon unrestrained expenditure. The pious desire to deprive the revolution of this excess is simply the desire to have a revolution without a revolution. Contrast this with what Eisenstein does in part two of Ivan the Terrible, where the only scene shot in colour, the penultimate reel, is the carnivalesque orgy in the Great Hall of the Count, a Bactinian phantasmatic space in which normal power relations are inverted. Here the Tsar is the slave of the idiot, whom he proclaims a new Tsar, and Ivan provides the imbecile Vladimir with all the imperial insignia, then humbly prostrates himself in front of him and kisses his hand. The scene begins with the obscene chorus and dance of the Oprichniks, 
Ivan's private army, staged in an entirely unrealistic way, an odd mixture of Hollywood and Japanese theatre, a musical number whose words tell a weird story. They celebrate the axe which cuts off the heads of Ivan's enemies. The song first describes a group of boyars having a rich meal. Down the middle, the golden goblets pass from hand to hand. The chorus then asks, with pleasurable nervous expectation, come along, come along, what happens next? Come on, tell us more. And the solo, Oprichnik, bending forward and whistling, shouts the answer. Strike with the axes. We are here at the obscene site where musical enjoyment meets political liquidation. And taking into account the fact that the film was shot in 1944, does this not confirm the carnivalesque character of the Stalinist purges? We encounter a similar nocturnal orgy in the third part of Ivan, which was not shot. See the scenario where the sacrilegious obscenity is explicit. Ivan and his oprichniks perform their nightly drinking feast as a black mass, with black monastic robes over their normal clothing. Therein resides the true greatness of Eisenstein, that he detected and depicted the fundamental shift in the status of political violence, from the Leninist liberating outburst of destructive energy to the Stalinist obscene underside of the law. Interestingly, the main opponent of Ivan in both parts of the film is not a man, but a woman, the old, powerful Euphrosina Staritskaya, Ivan's aunt, who wants to replace Ivan with her imbecilic son Vladimir, and thus effectively reign herself. In contrast to Ivan, who wants total power, but perceives it as a heavy load, exercising it as a means to an end, the creation of a great and powerful Russian state. Euphrosina is the subject of a morbid passion. For her, power is an end in itself. The aforementioned lines from Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit on the notion of womankind fit perfectly the figure of Ortrude in Wagner's Lohengrin. For Wagner, there is nothing more horrible and disgusting than a woman who intervenes in political life, driven by the desire for power. In contrast to male ambition, a woman wants power in order to promote her own narrow family interests, or even worse, her personal caprice, incapable as she is of perceiving the universal dimension of state politics. And does the same not hold for Ivan the Terrible? Is Euphrosina not the necessary counterpoint of the poisoned Ivan's bride, a gentle woman totally dedicated and submitted to her husband? Ivan's paradigmatic gesture is the following one. He puts on a show of horror and repentance at the bloodshed he had to set in train, and then, in a sudden reflexive gesture, he fully endorses his cruelty, demanding even more. In a typical moment in part two, inspecting the bodies of the boyars killed by his oprichniks, he humbly crosses himself. Suddenly, he stops and points at the ground a gleam of mad fury in his eyes, saying hoarsely, Too few! This jolting shift is best exemplified by the elementary trait in his acting. Repeatedly we see Ivan staring ahead with a pathetic expression on his face, as if passionately engrossed in a noble mission. Then, all of a sudden, he looks around suspiciously with an expression bordering on paranoid madness. A variation of this shift is the famous shot when, during his illness in part one, the priests prematurely, and all too eagerly, start to perform the rites for the dying. They cover his head with a gigantic sacred book. Holding a burning handle on his breast, Ivan participates in the ritual, murmuring prayers. All of a sudden, however, he struggles to raise his head from under the Bible, glances around the room as if trying desperately to get a view of the situation, and then, exhausted, drops back on the pillow beneath the book. This brings us to a scene which was planned as what Eisenstein called the Donné, the pivotal dramatic and emotional point of the entire trilogy. In the middle of part three, after the siege and destruction of Novgorod, a city which rebelled against his rule, Ivan, torn by inner doubts and qualms, asks for a priest and wants to confess. The shot is a long, continuous close-up of Ivan's head, covering half of the screen. The other half is filled by the confessor's cross, hanging by him, while Ivan enumerates to the priest the horrible deeds he was forced to carry out for the motherland. 
all of a sudden, Eustace, the confessor, gets all too interested in the names of those killed, a fact nicely signalled by the trembling of his cross, and eagerly asks about whether other names are also among the dead. Philip, and Timothy, and Michael? After reassuring him, we will catch him. Ivan is suddenly taken aback. He seizes Eustace's cross and drags it down until he is face to face with his confessor. Then his hands reach up the chain to the confessor's throat, and he starts to accuse him menacingly. Can it be that you too belong to this accursed line? Finally he explodes. Arrest him. Interrogate him. In a further climactic moment of part three, Ivan involves God himself in this dialectic. While in the church, a monk slowly reads the names of all those killed in Novgorod, Ivan lies prostrate in the dust beneath the large painting of the Last Judgment, from which sparks shoot out of the eyes of the celestial judge, and his grim face is full of rage. Ivan reflects on his bloodthirsty actions, trying to excuse them. It's not wickedness, not anger, not cruelty. It is to punish treason, treason against the common cause. Then, in anguish, he directly addresses God. You say nothing, celestial Tsar. He waits. There is no reply. Angrily, as though hurling a challenge, the earthly Tsar repeats menacingly to the celestial Tsar. You say nothing, celestial Tsar. The earthly Tsar, with a sudden violent gesture, hurls his bejeweled scepter at the celestial Tsar. The scepter smashes against the flat wall. In what exactly resides the libidinal economy of this strange twist. It is not that Ivan is simply torn by an inner conflict between his personal ethical qualms and the duty of the ruler who has to perform cruel acts for the sake of his country. It is also not that Ivan is simply bluffing, just hypocritically feigning moral torment. While his will to repent is absolutely sincere, he does not subjectively identify with it. He is lodged within the subjective split introduced by the symbolic order. He wants the ritual confession performed as proper externalized ritual, and he plays the game of confession in a totally sincere way, while at the same time retaining the position of a suspicious external observer of the entire spectacle, constantly vigilant, watching for a sudden stab in the back. All he wants is that the agent whom he is addressing, and from whom he expects forgiveness, will do his job properly, and not meddle in politics. In short, Ivan's paranoia is that he cannot trust the agent to whom he is ready to confess his sins. He suspects that this agent, ultimately God himself, also harbours a hidden political agenda of his own, running counter to Ivan's. This is why Stalin was here too quick when, in the famous nighttime conversation with Eisenstein, he reduced Ivan's religiosity to a moral obstacle which prevented Ivan from ruthlessly finishing off the job of destroying his enemies. Ivan the Terrible was extremely cruel. It is possible to show why he had to be cruel. One of the mistakes of Ivan the Terrible was that he did not completely finish off the five big feudal families. If he had destroyed these five families, then there would not have been the time of troubles. If Ivan the Terrible executed someone, then he repented and prayed for a long time. God disturbed him on these matters. It was necessary to be decisive. What Stalin, in spite of his genius, failed to grasp is how the spectacle of repentance was not an obstacle to the ruthless killing of his enemies, but rather helped constitute the self-propelling spiral of the endless oscillation between murder and repentance. This spiral would have reached its unbearable climax in part three of Ivan the Terrible. In the script for the film, there is a scene in the Great Hall of the Court in which Ivan accomplishes a proto-Stalinist purge among his own oprichniks. Addressing the gathered oprichniks, he ominously claims that there are some amongst us who have traded the cause of the oprichniks for gold. Without naming anyone, he goes on, there is amongst you one who is both venerable and who enjoys the highest confidence. And this wretch has betrayed my confidence. All eyes following Ivan's gaze are fixed on Ivan's faithful Alexei Bazmanov, including the eyes of Alexei's grief-stricken son, Fyodor. Then Ivan asks, who is worthy enough to cut off so wise a head? His eyes rest on Fyodor, whose head is lowered. Fyodor feels Ivan's gaze on him. He raises his head to look Ivan right in the eyes. 
With a scarcely perceptible movement, Ivan nods his head. Fyodor leaves the table, goes up to his father, and leads him off. In a dark place outside, Alexei confesses his guilt to his son, but tells him that he has piled up mountains of gold for his son and family, so that our line continues. He then implores his son to promise him that, after killing him, he will keep all the gold for their descendants. Fyodor swears the oath, father and son kiss, and the son then swiftly decapitates his father. The scene then returns to the great hall where Ivan, in a state of mounting tension and full of torment, looks at the door. At last the door opens and Fyodor reappears. His head is bowed, his hair sticking to his forehead. He raises his head. Ivan looks him straight in the eye. But already the gaze of Fyodor is impure. It cannot withstand that of Ivan. Ivan's lips twitch as he speaks hollowly. You showed no pity to your father, Fyodor. Why should you pity or defend me? Fyodor grasps that the Tsar has divined the secret talk between him and his father. Ivan utters the order, arrest him. Like a madman, Fyodor tries to throw himself on Ivan, but is stabbed by Stadens, a German of Prichnik's dagger. A single tear rolls down the grey beard of Tsar Ivan. It remains suspended on the point of his beard, like a raindrop on a funeral wreath. Ivan, have pity on me, O Lord, have pity. With the last atom of his strength, the dying Fyodor warns Ivan, do not trust the German, O Tsar. Ivan raises his heavy eyelids. His gaze stops on Staden. How promptly the foreign guest comes to the defence of the Tsar against his own oprichniks. The faithful Maluta quickly grabs Staden's shoulder with his heavy hand. Even here, the chain of betrayal and suspicion goes on, from Alexei to Fyodor, from Fyodor to Staden. In both cases, Ivan's suspicion falls on the very person who has just performed a murder to defend the Tsar. Whom can Ivan trust, even if the couple of faithful servants, Alexei Basmanov and his son Fyodor, end up betraying him, stealing and amassing treasures for the wealth and glory of their family? Malyuta Skuratov, his most trusted and doggishly devoted executioner, first met him when he led the mob which broke into the church where Ivan's coronation was in progress, with murder on his mind. At the end of part three, the dying Maluta, as it were, nominates his successor, the person whom Ivan can absolutely trust, Peter Volinets, the young man who, at the end of part two, had stabbed Vladimir to death, believing that he was killing Ivan. It is as though Ivan can truly trust only former traitors. The Minimal Difference One can imagine a Stalinist tragedy proper which would occur when the accused in a show trial, an ex-member of the nomenclatura, is compelled to admit that the unjust punishment that befell him is the outcome of his own previous political activity and is, in this sense, a sign of an ironic justice. That is, that, in this sense, he effectively is objectively guilty. But can one imagine Stalin himself undergoing a similar experience, recognizing in the madness of counter-revolutionary plots popping up all around him the result of his own madness? For structural reasons, no. What one can imagine is a successful coup d'etat staged by the upper nomenclature against Stalin, say in the last years of his life, when they were all again threatened by Stalin's anti-Semitic paranoia. But it would have been impossible to organize a show trial against Stalin himself, compelling him to confess that he had headed a conspiracy against true socialism. The most they could have done was to kill him discreetly while elevating him simultaneously into an untouchable dead master. In a way, this did happen in the late 1930s. One should always bear in mind that the notion of the infallibility of the Pope was forged in the late 19th century not to increase his power, but to curb it. A pope cannot nullify the decisions of his predecessors, since they are, by definition, infallible. And a similar paradox holds for Stalin. His deification, elevation into the untouchable supreme leader, coincides with the limitation of his real power. At the climax of the Great Purges, 
and the spiral of carnivalesque self-destruction threatened to swallow the upper nomenclatura itself, the Politburo stood up to Stalin, forcing him to share his authority with them. The standard characterization of Stalinist regimes as bureaucratic socialism is totally misleading and self-mystifying. It is the way the Stalinist regime itself perceived its problem, the cause of its failures and troubles. If there were not enough products in the stores, if the authorities failed to respond to people's demands, and so on and so forth, what was easier than to blame the bureaucratic attitude of indifference, petty arrogance, etc.? No wonder that, from the late 1920s onwards, Stalin was writing attacks on bureaucracy, on bureaucratic attitudes. Bureaucratism was nothing but an effect of the functioning of Stalinist regimes, and the paradox is that it is the ultimate misnomer. What Stalinist regimes really lacked was precisely an efficient bureaucracy, a depoliticized and competent administrative apparatus. One of the arguments of those who insist that communism, not fascism, was the true ethico-political catastrophe of the 20th century, rests on the fact that in all of Nazi Germany, there were only 25,000 Gestapo secret policemen to control the population, while the tiny GDR alone employed 100,000 secret policemen to control its much smaller population. Clear proof of the much more oppressive nature of the communist regime. However, what if one reads this fact in a different way? Fewer Gestapo agents were needed because the German population was much more morally corrupted in supporting the Nazis and thus collaborated with the regime than the GDR population. Why? Why did the GDR population resist much more? The answer is a paradoxical one. It is not that the people simply retained their ethical independence so that the regime was alienated from the substantial ethical life of the majority. Quite the contrary, resistance was an indication of the success of the ruling ideology. In their very resistance to the communist regime, the people relied on the official ideology itself, which often blatantly contradicted reality. Actual freedom, social solidarity, true democracy. One should never forget the extent to which the dissident resistance was indebted to the official ideology. For this precise reason, one can claim that today's North Korea is no longer a communist country, not even in the Stalinist sense. It cut the links with the legacy of the Enlightenment, whose notion of universality compels a regime to expose all its citizens to official propaganda. Shin Dong-hyok, who escaped a total control zone in North Korea and reached South Korea via China, reports that the prisoners sent to such zones can never come out. They are put to work in mines or logging camps until they die. The authorities do not even bother to give them ideological education. The children who are born to parents in these zones, and destined to spend their entire lives in them, are only taught the elementary skills necessary for mining and farming. There were up to 1,000 children but no textbooks in the school at Valley No. 2, the part of the camp where Shin lived. In all of North Korea, Villages are decorated with communist slogans and portraits of Kim Jong-il. Valley No. 2 had only one slogan carved into a wooden plaque. Everyone obey the regulations. What we have here is thus the disciplinary mechanism at its purest, deprived of any ideological justification. All North Koreans are expected to look up to their beloved leader. When blind patients were asked by Western journalists why they wanted to see they all claimed that it was in order to catch the sight of Kim Jong-il, to whom they owed everything. All except those prisoners who are thus literally reduced to subhuman status, excluded from the social community. It is worth returning here to Ernst Nolte's book on Heidegger, because it seriously approaches the task of grasping Nazism as a feasible political project, of trying to recreate the story the Nazis were telling themselves about themselves, which is a sine qua non of the effective criticism. The same has to be done for Stalinism. Nolte also formulated the basic terms and topics of the revisionist debate, whose first tenet is to objectively compare fascism and communism. Fascism 
and even Nazism was ultimately a reaction to the communist threat and a repetition of its worst practices, concentration camps, mass liquidations of political enemies. Could it be the case that the National Socialists and Hitler carried out an Asiatic deed, the Holocaust, only because they considered themselves and their kind to be potential or actual victims of a Bolshevik Asiatic deed? Didn't the Gulag archipelago precede Auschwitz? Reprehensible as it was, Nazism was thus temporally what appeared after communism. It was also, with regard to its content, an excessive reaction to the communist threat. Furthermore, all the horrors committed by Nazism merely copied the horrors already committed by Soviet communism, the reign of the secret police, concentration camps, genocidal terror. Nolte's conclusion is thus that communism and Nazism share the same totalitarian form, and that the difference concerns only the empirical agents which fill the same structural places, Jews instead of class enemy, and so on and so forth. The standard liberal leftist reaction to Nolte consisted in a moralistic outcry. Nolte relativizes Nazism, reducing it to a secondary echo of communist evil, but how can one even compare communism, this thwarted attempt at liberation, with the radical evil of Nazism? In contrast to this dismissal, one should fully concede Nolte's central point. Yes, Nazism was in fact a reaction to the communist threat. It did indeed just replace class struggle with the struggle between Aryans and Jews. The problem, however, resides in this just, which is by no means as innocent as it appears. We are dealing here with displacement, Verscheibung, in the Freudian sense of the term. Nazism displaces class struggle onto racial struggle, and thereby obfuscates its true sight. What changes in the passage from communism to Nazism is the form, and it is in this change of the form that the Nazi ideological mystification resides. The political struggle is naturalized into the racial conflict, the class antagonism inherent in the social structure is reduced to the invasion of a foreign Jewish body, which disturbs the harmony of the Aryan community. The difference between fascism and communism is thus formal ontological. It is not, as Nolte claims, that we have in both cases the same formal antagonistic structure, where only the place of the enemy is filled in with a different positive element, class, race. In the case of race, we are dealing with a positive naturalized element. The presupposed organic unity of society is perturbed by the intrusion of the foreign body. While class antagonism is absolutely inherent in and constitutive of the social field, fascism thus obfuscates antagonism, translating it into a conflict of positive opposed terms. It is here that one has to make the choice the pure liberal stance of equidistance towards leftist and rightist totalitarianism. They are both bad, based on the intolerance of political and other differences, the rejection of democratic and humanist values, and so on. Is a priori false? One has to take sides and proclaim one fundamentally worse than the other. For this reason, the ongoing relativization of fascism the notion that one should rationally compare the two totalitarianisms, etc., always involves the explicit or implicit thesis that fascism was better than communism, an understandable reaction to the communist threat. In a letter, to which I have already referred in Chapter 3, to Herbert Marcuse on January 20th, 1948, Heidegger wrote, to the serious legitimate charges that you express about a regime that murdered millions of Jews, I can merely add that if instead of Jews you had written East Germans, then the same holds true for one of the Allies, with the difference that everything that has occurred since 1945 has become public knowledge, while the bloody terror of the Nazis, in point of fact, had been kept a secret from the German people. Marcuse was fully justified in replying that the thin difference between brutally expatriating people and burning them in a concentration camp 
is the line that, at that moment, separated civilization from barbarism. One should not shrink from going a step further. The thin difference between the Stalinist gulag and the Nazi annihilation camp was also, at that historical moment, the difference between civilization and barbarism. Let us take Stalinism at its most brutal, the de kulakization of the early 1930s. Stalin's slogan was that kulaks as a class should be liquidated. What does this mean? It can mean many things, from taking away their property, land, to forcibly removing them to other areas, say from Ukraine to Siberia, or simply into a gulag. But it did not mean simply to kill them all. The goal was to liquidate them as a class, not as individuals. Even when the rural population was deliberately starved, millions of dead in Ukraine again, the goal was not to kill them all, but to break their backbone, to brutally crush their resistance, to show them who was the master. The difference, minimal but crucial, persists here with regard to the Nazi de-Judaization, where the ultimate goal effectively was to annihilate them as individuals, to make them disappear as a race. In this sense, then, Ernst Nolte is right. Nazism was a repetition, a copy of Bolshevism. In Nietzsche's terms, it was a profoundly reactive phenomenon.